All right, so we have an experiment that was conducted to investigate the relationship between the dose of pain medication and the number of hours of pain relief. 20 individuals with chronic pain were randomly assigned to one of five doses. So 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, and 2 in milligrams medication. The results are given in the scatter plot. All right, so the data were used to fit a least squares regression line and predict the number of hours of pain relief for a given dose. Which of these would be revealed by the plot of the residuals of the regression versus the dose? Okay, so let's start off. Let's just kind of like draw like um like an, an idea of what like the regression line would go look like. So you know, it's, you know, it's a line that will best approximate all the data. So some, maybe something like this. Now. Let's let's review or let's remember that the residuals are essentially the the values that the data points are from the least squared regression line measured you know measured measured vertically. So the residuals would be like the length of these line segments. So, so the residuals are small here, get, they get bigger here. Um, so part A or answer A. Some of the residuals are less than zero. We don't know. It could be um, we have some positive. Remember, if it's above the graph, these these are positive values. These are overestimations. Or I mean, these graphs, these values are greater than what the than what the least squares regression would estimate. So low here, they would be negative. So we don't know if the negative values outweigh the positive. Could be this, but we can't say that for sure. B, the sum of the residuals is greater than zero. Same idea. We don't know that either. There are outliers associated with the lower doses. So the lower doses would be over here. And these are no, be the opposite. These are actually closer. And remember, outliers are values that are farther, so definitely not C. <clears throat> um, the variation in the hours of pain relief is not the same across the doses. So, okay, so this is this would be the solution. Or this would be the answer. So let's look at what this means. So remember, we say variation. So it's kind of like thinking of how how much the, the values differ from each other. So if we pick a specific hour, let's say point or a specific dose, 0.5, the variation is you know the only you know the distance from here to here, um, so to speak. That's the idea behind you know vary like the range of values. But if we go to one, the variation becomes bigger, like the range of values becomes larger. If we go to 1.5, the variation you know goes all the way from here to here becomes even larger. And two, same, it gets, becomes its largest. So um, it's definitely not the same across the doses. So our answer would be D. For a large store as a customer service department where customers can go ask for help if, what well, with the store related issues? According to store records, approximately one fourth of all customers who go to the service department ask for help, so ask for help finding an item. Assume the reason each customer goes to the service department is independent from customer to customer. So independent, so the reason one customer goes is not related to the reason that another one goes. Based on the approximation, what's the probability that at least one of the next four customers who go to the service department will ask for help finding an item? Okay, so we're trying to find this. What's the probability that if we let X represent the number of customers that are gonna go ask for help, we would say, what's the probability that X is greater than or equal to one? Because if you say at least one, it could be one, two, three, or four. So we don't want to go about like finding that because there's a whole bunch of, there's, it's a whole mess of calculations and combinations. So instead, what we want to do is that we want to do one minus the, pro, remember the, the contrapositive or the opposite of not, um, so to speak, of not uh, having at least one is having zero. So one minus the probability that zero customers go would be equal to the probability that at least one customer would ask, would go. So this is a much easier calculation to figure out. So um, we do one minus. Now let's break this down a little bit. Um, if the probability that a customer goes to ask for help is one fourth, the probability that they don't go is three fourths, because either they go or they don't go. Now, if we're talking about four in a row, since they're independent, you would do three fourths times three fourths, times three fourths, times three fourths. That's the probability of four customers in a row not going and not asking for help. And that's just one minus three fourths all to the fourth. And so our answer would be C. All right, 33. 
All right, data were collected from a longitudinal study designed to investigate the relationship between blood sugar levels and brain shrinkage. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this has turned out okay, brain shrinkage. Doesn't sound good. Anyways, on the results of the analysis, the data for 22 observations are shown in the table below. So here's our computer output. Which of the following represents a 98% confidence interval for, for the slope of the least squares regression line for brain shrinkage on blood levels? That sounds terrible. I don't mean to laugh, but it's terrible that that would happen to someone. Anyways, um, so we want to um, let's let's go about like making a, a confidence interval. When we start with our point estimate, since we're trying to estimate the slope, we we're trying to estimate you know beta. But sample slope would be B then, or because that's what we usually use for um, like a linear equation. We tend to let me just write A plus like we usually have A plus B X is Y hat as our least squares regression line equation. Now um, our point estimate plus or minus our critical value, our T star in this case, times the standard error, the slope. So our point estimate, our sample slope would be this 0.61. So since we're trying to use blood sugar to um, predict brain shrinkage, on, brain shrinkage amount. So it'd be one point or 0.161 plus or minus. Our T star, we want to we were, we have to figure that out by using our degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom for for um, estimating population slope from you know sample slope data is gonna be two less than our sample size. So make sure you, you remember that. So it's usually, n, we, on a lot of cases, it's one less, it's n minus one, but in this case, it'll be n minus two. So we would have 22 minus two would be 20. Now, um, some calculators can, you can figure out the T star uh, by, running the, by running the function in some calculators. This one you can, so I get to do the fun way with my t, t, t table. So I look down here, we're 98% confidence interval. Go to the row that has 20 degrees of freedom. Go across and we would see it's 2.528. So plus 2.528 times standard error. Of, and since, remember, we're, since we're talking about blood sugar, we're gonna be using the 0.073 as our standard error value. And so then, looks like our answer would be C. All right, in a certain computer card game, the player is awarded five points for each card that is moved to the correct position. The player is penalized 10 points for each minute the game is played. Let the random variable X represent the number of cards moved to the correct position. And let the random variable Y represents the number of minutes that the game is played. The means and, st and the means and standard deviations of the random variables for, for a particular player are shown in the table below. Assuming that X and Y are independent, what, are, what is the expected value in the standard and the standard deviation of the points per game for the player? Okay, so let's make another variable. I like to use T. That's going to represent the number of points you earn. So it would be five times X, because you get five points each time you know, card is moved to the correct position, minus 10Y, because you lose 10 points each time a minute passes, and that's represented by Y. So if we want to find the mean of T, that's going to be equal to five times the mean of X minus 10 times the mean of Y. So we go, we can use these values, it'd be 10, five times 9.5, minus 10 times 5.4. Use your calculator value. So negative 6.5. So we know it's gonna be either A or B. And now we figure out the standard deviation. Now, this is a little counterintuitive, but to figure out the standard deviation of T, you want to find the variance. So the standard deviation or squared first. And 
again, even, and again, it's counterintuitive because even though these, this equation involves subtraction, variance um, is always just going to be adding, is, is always involved adding um, the variances of the, the terms in your equation. Um, and th the way you want to think about it is because your you're, um, variance and standard deviation are measures of spread. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're subtracting or adding. Whoa. Um, we're, th there, there's still going to be uh, like uh, uh, a spread amount between you know values, whether if you subtract or add them. Like if you have something that's you know 10 feet minus 20 feet, it doesn't matter if you 10 feet minus 20 feet, um, or 10 feet plus 20 feet, um, because they're still the same the same difference between each other. 10 and negative 20 are both 30 away, and 10 and 20 and 10 20 are you know going to be 30 or make 30. So um, well, no, it's, that's not a really good explanation, but just remember, just remember it's measure of spread. But anyways, so then this would look like this. We would have five squared times the standard deviation of x squared minus 10 squared times standard deviation of y squared. So I'm just going to do this on my calculator. So we would have 5 squared 25 times 12.9 squared plus 10 squared, so plus 100 times 1.1 1 .1 squared, 4,281. Now, this is, remember, variance. So to find standard deviation, you would take the square root of variance. Because remember, standard deviation of t is the square root of the variance of t. So we take the square root of this number. That's the same as raising it to the 0.5 power. And it would be about 65.843. Oh, well, these are very close. So the answer would be B. Probably, this is usually the hardest unit in statistics for a lot of students. Um, so don't so, um, review it if you really want to do well on it. But um, it's uh, it's a lot of logic and it can be very uh, annoying. I wouldn't I wouldn't spend too much time on these types of problems if you um, if you find them confusing on your test because um, because again um, probability is always usually the most difficult part of the AP exam. Anyways. Um, 35, a program that was intended to cure a person's fear of spiders was offered at a local zoo, okay? Volunteers with a fear of spiders, I can see what's coming, volunteers, participated in the program, which included holding a spider, that's, that doesn't sound fun, holding a spider for 15 minutes. One month after they completed the program, the participants were contacted and surveyed about the program. Over 90% of the participants claimed they were cured of the fear of spiders. Wow, that's, and that's amazing. Um, Based on the description of the program, which the following statements is true. All right. So because over 90% of the participants claim to be cured, the results prove that holding a spider will cure a person's fear of spider. Um, no. <laughs> um, to prove um, something, you have to do an experiment. Um, this is, an experiment was not done. So this is not a, it's not gonna be A. Because over 90% of participants claim to be cured, the results can be generalized to the, part of pop, to the population of all people who have a fear of spiders. No, because it can't be generalized to the population of all people because these are volunteers, and we can argue and, and like re, like reasonably so that volunteers are different than the average person, which I yeah I would say they are. They're different. They're different. Um, um it takes a lot to volunteer for stuff. I would say. So it wouldn't be B. Because the participants were volunteers, the study is a census of all the people in the local area who have a fear of spiders. That just kind of, again, goes against what we just said. Because the participants were self-selected, a person's desire to be cured could be a confounding variable. Okay, so yeah. So that's, again, we would argue that, um, that since these are volunteers, we don't know that um, doing this um, method, holding a spider for 15 minutes, would, would work for everybody because not everyone has can be. You know, we can claim to have the same, you know, sort of you know personality or characteristics as volunteers. So our answer would be D.